Well, happy Thursday, Smite fans. You are watching the Smite Challenger Circuit. Normally I'd say EU or NA, but we've got a little bit of a mix for you here today. A couple EU sets and an NA set to round out the day on Thursday. And then, of course, SPL starts, so then we'll have SEC at the top of each day on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Here's your schedule for EU. couple on Thursday, as you see there, and then Clay Soldiers Jest F6 will play on Saturday. And then NA, one set each day, Thursday, Friday, Sunday, so no set there on Saturday. Uh, my name is Dolson. Mifflin is here with me. Mif, we're going to start off with a pretty good one here. Pandemonium versus Snake Hunters, then Elysium versus Accounting Department uh, after that. And, and this is a region over here in EU that, that's neck and neck. I mean, there, there's one team up top in Pandemonium that's 2-0, and and then there's a block of teams there at 1-1. One and one, Very contested here in Europe. Yeah, both or every team in this league has really looked very good. Teams that we would have expected coming off of last season that were really dominant haven't quite been able to find their footing. Some new rookies in the SEC have really found their footing early on. I think in this first set, as you already highlighted, inside of Pandemonium versus Snake Hunters, we've got a really good set. Keep your eyes on Pandemonium in particular. I mean, they're undefeated for a reason. I think they're just a step above the rest right now. That's, of course, Streak Up Preds, Joshi, Sarpe, and Kana. And, and I've loved, admittedly, Miff, what I've seen out of, out of Kana there in that solo lane. We, we've started to see this rise of the, the carry potential. Ramsey's going to get some water, so that's why my ghost door is, is opening behind me there. Uh, but, but really, the, the solo lane has been so interesting to watch, I think, in the onset of the SEC here. Is that a trend you imagine continues? I don't want to get too much into SPL talk, but we'll get into that a little bit tomorrow. What are your thoughts, though, on the solo lane, maybe specifically Kana here and how he's been for this Pandemonium squad? I think that you're right to highlight the solo lane, especially when we're talking about the European SCC, because it feels like the solo lane isn't really a solo lane anymore over there. It's really just jungle and solo of teaming up, kind of reminiscent of what we saw towards the beginning of Season 5 or the tail end of Season 4, where it's almost a 2-1-2 meta for the first five or six minutes. That's really been the trend inside of Europe. And I think they're right to do it when they have such huge talents out of the solo lane, like Kana, as you already highlighted, Deathwalker back in the European SCC as well. It's just... A role right now that is so hard to lock down what actives are really the best, what starter items do they really need. But whatever team is able to have their soul laner rotate out first generally finds a great footing inside of the early game neutral team fights around Gold Fury or in the 3v3 in mid. So you right. really do want to have your jungler over there to make sure that your soul laner can leave. And again, having Kana on your squad for Pandemonium has allowed a lot of that. And a lot of the reason that this Pandemonium team is 2 0. I think Kana's really leaned in. Uh, to the Sun Wukong, Guan Yu's been a, a popular pick here. Uh, Kukulin as well. The, these lane bully-esque gods have really fit into this guy's wheelhouse well. So uh, Cozy's going to have a tough time today in this matchup, especially against teams like Elysium. I mean, Elysium is, is, is such a name-recognizable team, and the fact that Pandemonium was able to take a set off of them still pretty wild here. But Miff, I, I think this guy as well deserves a, a bit of a highlight. I think Streakup has had a great start to his SCC this year as well. Yeah, Streak Up has had a really good start, but you already highlighted how Kha'Zix going to have some trouble over in the soul lane. I mean, talking about Streak Up, you got to talk about that Vaporish Coast matchup up against the Penta Kid. I think that it's going to be a very contentious dual lane. I'm expecting Sparks to fly early on. Aggressive picks pretty consistently. Streak Up has been playing a lot of that Apollo, the ROM, things along those lines where you really want to dash in and get involved. Whereas Vaporish Coast has been playing more so the Heimdalls and things along those lines, even the Jingwei at times. I'll be very excited to see how that duo plays out. Yeah, Preds, uh, the other part of this Pandemonium duo lane has been pretty flexible, I think, in his god picks as well, whether it's the Kepri, more facilitator, some setup, some, some res there, a lot of that utility play. Preds has been able to fill that role as well as the heavy engage type gods. On the other side of things, though, you, you got to look at the Snake Hunters team, one and one, right in the middle of that pack, four teams grouped up here, tied for second place in the EU SEC. So th this is where you start to close that gap. You could have two teams tied for first, technically, after this matchup of Snake Hunters were able to win. Vaporish Coast, as you mentioned, Shoxy, Foxy, Gunter, Rapio, and Kha'Zix. Uh, uh, talk to me a little bit about what you've seen out of Rapio, out of the jungle. Um, do, do you think that he's looked good enough to, to give this team an edge here over Pandemonium? Rapio is a player that I really associated with that uh, adapting ideology, like the Season 5, Season 4, Season 3 adapting, where it's a much more kind of measured pace where you wait till that mid game to really get involved but here 
Rapio really has been playing a much more early game centric role. He's been looking at gods like Kamazots and building him crit, by the way, or Erlang Shen, and also building him crit. Maybe crit's just a common factor for Rapio. Must be. But I really am liking what I'm seeing from him. His, uh, his willingness to get involved in the early game and dictate the pace for his team has been phenomenal. Mm. Oh, I forgot about this play. What, what a nutty turnaround that was from Kha'Zix. I mean, it's almost unjust that that last tower shot didn't fly through. Very close to a double kill there. I mean, this solo lane, I mean, the more I look at these highlights and, and, and lead into this, I mean, if this is anything but flashy and, and, and aggressive between Kha'Zix and Kana, I, I might be a little bit disappointed here on this side. So then you have to wonder, Myth, and, and we'll get into it here in just a moment, you wonder then if, if the solo lane starts to become a little bit higher priority in the pick ban phase. We've already seen Guan Yu really at the top of that chart, kind of regardless of the matchup over there in the solo lane, but... Maybe in a matchup that's so important, we see these teams lean into that a little more. We could, but there's just so much talent over there inside of the solo god pool. I mean, you get rid of the Guan Yu, there's still Kukulin, Cerberus, all right. these other dominant gods much. over there that you can't really ban out everything. So I think the strategy really has been, all right, we're going to get rid of Guan Yu because he's a little bit above the rest as far as just tier list goes. And then we can let it just fall out. Maybe one team gets Kukulin, the other team gets tier, and you're not feeling too awful about it. But uh, I think right. you are right that we might see a little bit more focus over there. Miff, you look nice today. This is the first time I've looked down at your, your solo Just since today? we started here. You're, well, okay, all right. <laughs> only, only you, Mifflin, can take a genuine compliment like that and then transition it into, into me looking like a bad guy. This is unbelievable. I'm saying you look oh, nice. Oh, man. This is the first Thank time you. I looked down at your solo while you were talking or your single while you were talking, and I, I was just giving you a compliment. But no, it's it's on me. Right, it's not. I'll, I'll remind you every single day now, Miff, that uh, that you look good. You, you've now trained me into giving you a compliment day in and day out. Let's let's reroute ourselves in some analysis here. Picks and bans starting for game number one between Pandemonium and Snake Hunters. Tiamat continues to be high priority. Supports as well. For all the talk that we've done about the solo lane, obviously this is pretty matchup specific, but but supports are, are still in that high ban priority area. Yamoja. And Sobek, admittedly, still surprises me, Myth. Why, why do we maybe see so many Sobek bans here? Sobek is just a versatile god, man. I mean, he's going to work out wherever you put him. If you need him inside of support, you need him inside of solo, it's just going to work with itemization changes kind of shifting their way towards early game focus. If you want to rush Sovereignty or Heart Ward, Sobek gets his defense online just a little bit more quickly than every other support just because of the passive as well. I think that... Really, it just is. Sobek is a jack of all trades, master of most of them as well. So most teams just don't want to let him through. Yeah, I, I just don't even. I don't like being in a lane with a Sobek. You know, you, you're under this constant threat, just one pluck, and suddenly you're either beads or, or you're dead. So just that pressure, certainly enough in lane, and then as the late game goes on, uh, difficult to take down. Guan Yu not banned out here. That's a notable standout after picks or bans rather for game number one. But Apollo and Scylla end up being the first two off the board. So Hunter on one side, Myth. Looks like Pandemonium got the Hunter they were looking for. But what a world we live in where Scylla continues to be the highest priority mid laner. Yeah, what a world we live in where Guan Yu is getting just left by the wayside in the top three. And that's not the only crazy pick that's still available, Dave. I mean, wow. Set's still out there. Persephone's still making the rounds as well. But I agree with Snake Hunters going ahead and just foregoing their ADC and their top two picks because we haven't really seen Pandemonium run the double hunter draft, meaning that Snake Hunters should have a little bit of time before they have to really go towards their hunter, preferably in this third slot if they really want to prioritize it. Otherwise, Pandemonium likely going to ban out two in their next ban phase, but so far, so good from both squads. Achilles and Persephone locked in by Pandemonium. Wow. That's a strong core already. I was going to say, that, that top three is fantastic for Pandemonium. Persephone was far and away the, the top pick last year in Season 7, if left open. This year so far, from what we've seen in Season 8, ha has drifted into the top three still. Still in that top three uh, worthy, but maybe not first overall from what we've seen. Tsukiyomi now taken away in a very similar thread of priority, as this Persephone, I'd argue. And Guan Yu, interestingly enough, completely looked over in the first six picks here, might be addressed in the second wave of bans. What do we think about Achilles, though, at the moment here, Mifflin? We, we saw a little bit of Achilles there in Season 7, had the ability to take over the laning phase there in the solo lane. Do you think that potential is still there as we move into Season 8? 
I think it could certainly work out in the soul lane, but the majority of the time we've seen Achilles recently, it's a couple of rounds over in support, and majority of the time yeah, point. really has been going into the jungle here. So I'd be surprised to see where Snake Hunters think this Achilles is going. It seems like they think it's either going to be support or it's going to be solo. They're throwing their first band towards that nemesis, and the second band towards the Kepri seems like they really are hedging their bets, maybe saying this Achilles is likely going to solo. And then a couple Hunter bands as well from Pandemonium to uh, to round out. Actually, three, technically, if you consider the Heimdall in the first wave of bands. So Snake Hunters are going to have to look somewhere else for that final, or for that Hunter pick, rather. Kumba Karna has been, I feel, so tumultuous with us here, Mifflin, because, look, 20% pick rate. He's been picked in a fifth of the games and has only won a third of those. Granted, it's uh, only three games played so far here in the USCC. So one out of three from what we've seen here from Kumba. But I feel like we, we haven't been excited to see this Kumba Karna picked in the games that we've seen him do you think that this type of draft that snake hunters have gets you a little more excited for the kumba anytime i see kumba karna and scylla together i mean it's just a combo made sure. in heaven the the groggy strike sets up for i'm a monster on its own epic uppercut does the exact same even the mez there's really no reason the scylla shouldn't be able to find an ultimate inside of these team fights as long as kumba karna is alive but you're right to say that it's not a super exciting pick because Kuma Karna is not a solo agent. He's not walking up and, and zoning off five members on his own or dealing a ton of Whoa. damage or anything along those lines. It's how well it matches up with their mid laner. And I think with Scylla, it's just going to work. Now, for the first time, we'll see X-Ball drafted here. Jabalanke joins the Snake Hunters draft myth. Is that a hunter? that you expected to see here. Obviously, saw some play there towards uh, the end of Season 7, mid-Season 7, uh, but with the way the Hunter meta has gone here recently, admittedly, I didn't expect X-Ball to come out. I've honestly been surprised we haven't seen a little bit more Shibalanke. With Death Toll back in the game, he doesn't struggle at all with mana sustain. I mean, he's just constantly allowed to use that branching bolas. He's got CC immunity on the dash. I mean, a global ultimate, not really the same level of global as something like Apollo brings or Chernabog. But I think that he certainly is a god that can very well make his way into late game and then outbox just about every other hunter in the game. But... I think it's pretty clear why we're seeing Shibalanka come through in this game. Already three Hunter bans as well as an Apollo first pick overall. Right. The big question mark <laughs> to me, though, is why is Vaporish Coast not going to the Chernabog? That's been a huge priority, especially right. in the USCC. Yeah, Chernabog has been that immediate follow-up to the Apollo more often than not. We will see if the Shibalanka can keep pace with Apollo. Game number one, Pandemonium versus Snake Hunter starts right now. Thank you, Dulcet and Mifflin. Finch and Aggro here as they move into game one here in the EU SCC. And as they covered a little bit of spice here, we don't see a whole lot of Shibalanke anymore. But kind of as Mif said, that Death Toll is an option for him. And it's Death Tolls into Devourer's Gauntlet as that first start, that spiked gauntlet. I was wondering if we might see a Transcendence, but it can feel so hard to get Lifesteal into the build if that's the route you go with that early Transcendence. Exactly. I mean, Aussie is normally the option, Blood Forge as well, but I think that, as Mifflin was saying, the Death Toll sustain is kind of enough now with Branching Bola that, that you can end up leaving it, certainly at rank 1 and not have to worry about your MP5 at all. Maybe if you start maxing it, then you're going to have some trouble, but I'd imagine that Coast is going to end up maxing the 2 because that's the change that Gibalanka has seen the most recently. A pretty big buff to Poison Darts where he gets more darts shooting out and gods can be affected by more darts so you get a lot more damage if you can end up barrel stuffing that poison darts i do anticipate that's where coast is going to go and if that's the case you don't really need the transcendence right, he'll be looking more for that consistent damage in these fights excited to see how he and streak up might even end up in lane meanwhile it's preds taking this Kabrakan into the support role. Here's another Guardian that we've seen get a little bit more love lately, and he now being picked up to add some aggression, to add the potential to really start these fights early, early on, as both these supports get over to lane right away. And that has felt like kind of the, the priority in these supports. We still sometimes see the real traditional supports, but you kind of want someone in the support role who can get into the action early on, helping them make it over to that 3v3 because they rotate them in a little sooner. It feels like they, they like to prioritize these, these aggressive supports here nowadays. Yeah. I mean, why Geb shield your teammate when you can just kill the person that's going on? <laughs> that's kind of what Kabraken does really well. Kumakarna much more peel oriented, just trying to, yeah. to create space between the diver and the person getting dove. But I, I, I'm more of a fan of picks like this Kabraken. I mean, it's not like Snake Hunters are lacking for Guardian damage, though. They've got Cozy on that, on that Cerberus who has looked really, really strong to kick off Season 8. 
I was really excited to see, you know, us talk a little bit about some of these mage builds, Myth, because, or excuse me, not Myth, Aggro, because of... Uh, when wow, you go forgotten Sans, already, right? huh? I've already <laughs> been so replaced having, by Mifflin. That's tough, Yeah, so used to have my bud right there with me, huh? But whatever World's Finals do, I certainly I don't remember who I'm with, but when do you go the Sands of Time as opposed to this Conduit Gem, or we even see sometimes the Restored Artifact in place on one of those starter items. Streak Up gets aggressive, Coast is low but not a chance for those kills. So, so what can you tell us about when you choose these different mage starter items? I think that right now for me, uh, I'm looking at what the upgrades are going to be able to do for me come level sure. 20. I mean, it's got to be able to be competitive early on. You know, at the very beginning of Season 8, Conduit Gem was just out clearing Sands of Time and Vampiric Shroud and every other option in mid so much that it didn't really matter if the level 20 upgrades were better. But now when you look at what Conduit Gem does, I'm a little bit surprised to see Gunter go for Sands of Time. I think that Scylla does need the, the help early on wave clearing. And that's where I make my decision in the early game at least, is do I need the help? Scylla, I would say yes. Persephone, I would say probably not. And Persephone is just so, you need so much cooldown on that character that Sands yeah. of Time really makes the most sense to me. Plus, Pendulum of Ages is an insane upgrade. You get 190 power from Pendulum of Ages, plus 20% CDR. That's when you're at full mana, you get the 190. But when you've got Rod of Tahuti in the build, when you've got the MP5 fr from that Pendulum of Ages, you're going to be full mana like all the time anyways. So I think Pendulum is really, really strong. But it, for me, if, if I could use either the early help with the wave clear for Conduit Gem or my character uses Gem of Focus very well. Archmage's Gem is, is, is falling off. I don't really love that item anymore. But I'm a big fan of Gem of Focus. And for gods like Merlin or Changa that just spam buttons all the time, that Gem of Focus passive feels really, really good. I, I'm not surprised to see neither Scylla nor uh, Persephone really want that option, though. Uh, yeah, I initially thought, you know, that, that you kind of consider that Pendulum of Ages is something that was a bit front-loaded. You know, maybe that first rotation was doing more damage. Kind of as you covered, you end up with a lot of mana in the late game with some of these mage builds. So you're getting a lot of that extra power. I think it is persuasive to want to go with that Sands of Time into the Pendulum of Ages later on. Certainly makes some sense there for me. Take a look at these junglers, both of them. Well, not both of them, only the Bumba Stagger and Lapio Eye of the jungle over there for Sarpe. A question of if you need uh, additional attack speed, I suppose, or if you really want that sustain in this early game too. And I, I am I'm obsessed with with the timing of, of these starter items, of, of these greater scorpions, and we do go clear those over the gold buff when you over fire giant too. There's a lot of new stuff here at the start of this season eight. We're about to see it in the pros' hands tomorrow, excitingly, but we don't want to get too ahead of ourselves. We've got two excellent teams in Pandemonium and Snake Hunters trying to get the best of all these season eight changes right now. I mean, this is a this is an awesome matchup. I mean, Pandemonium coming off a huge win up against Elysium. Snake Hunters <laughs> lost to Elysium week one, and we kind of go, oh, you know. The Snake Hunters team is going to be good. They just ran into an unstoppable force. We kind of think Elysium's going to run away with the league. And then Pandemonium shuts us up pretty quickly with that storyline. So this is not, you know, this is a really good test for both of these squads. Pandemonium gets to keep their momentum, stay undefeated, look really good. Or can Snake Hunters throw their hat in that ring and try and look, make it look like a three-team race? Well, it's eight members in right. Start pay for to the ultimate. He's already low. Preds gets hit as well as the epic uppercut comes out. I'm a monster is there, but somehow still alive. Is Preds in the back, but Rapio takes care of Sarpe. Gunter gets the kill onto the Cabracket in the back, and that's two for zero in favor of Snake Hunters, and they are not done. Jockey goes down. A double for Rapio, and what a way to start off this game for Snake Hunters. Three for zero, and they might be able to get another member here if Kana sticks around a little bit too long. They'll settle for his buff if they can, or maybe they won't. I don't think a dive is the call from here, but certainly good poke damage coming from Cozy. Snake Hunters just do a really good job in that engagement of splitting up the fight. Rapio's in an awkward position to go on. They look to go on him and Gunter early on, but Sarpe's ultimate does not deal a whole lot of damage. He's caught in an awkward position. And that Gibalanke ultimate is a huge reason why that fight gets so split up. It's really hard sometimes for the spectator at home to, to, to understand how disruptive those Gibalanke ultimates could be, but Pandemonium's a good team. They're not getting split up that easily the vast majority of the time. You know, Joshi's ultimate isn't whiffing the vast majority of the time. You have to give credit to that Darkest of Nights ultimate as the reason why a lot of that fight went awkwardly. 
And you're seeing the built-in synergy of the draft really nicely. I mean, Shock sees ultimate straight into Gunter's ultimate, separates the fight even more, and then Rapio can come in and clean up beautifully with that ult from Tsukiyomi. Yep, I mean, it's going to be free on a monster damage for Gunter all game long with this great setup from Shoxy. We saw it there. Makes things look kind of easy there for Sneak Hunters. But if you're a Pandemonium fan, I don't see a whole lot of reason to panic just yet. This gold's not really that far out of control. And the experience, really not that far out of control either. A bit of a lead there for Gunter. You even have a lead for Streak Up if you're over there for Pandemonium. So things are very much still close. About a thousand favorite Pandemonium if you don't love it. But they can't find more aggression there in mid. Pred gets slowed down. So it's a great early fight for Snake Hunters. But we might end up needing to see a little bit more from them. But really, looking at these drafts, I mean, neither one of these teams have to do great early, right? These are teams that are going to yeah. move into the mid to late perfectly fine. They scale pretty well on both ends, I'd say. I, I am curious on what Sarpe on how Sarpe is going to scale in this game. Because Kamazots, I mean, normally we see him boots, Jotuns, or Brawlers, or Crusher. You know, just this pen build. Focusing on using those ob those abilities really effectively, but he's going for an auto attack centric build. It looks like to me. I mean that it's Ninja Tabby has the eye of the jungle for the attack speed already, and then that's probably going to be a stone cutting would be my guess. That's coming out of that yep. thousand fold blade, and I'm I'm gonna go with skeptical uh, that this build is going to be as effective as the traditional pen build. I mean it. If you can start to get this build online and start chainsawing people down with your autos, I'm sure it's going to feel great. But in the late game, you're not going to be able to auto attack people. Plus, I mean, Tsukiyomi on the other end, disarm and stun. You've got a lot. You've got Shoxy Foxy, who's maybe the best guardian in the game at keeping auto attack characters like Kali and Bakasura away from carries. Let alone someone like Kamazots, who really isn't as auto attack focused most of the time. Uh. uh I'll, I'll hold judgment for now, but I think Sarpe has got to prove a lot with these auto attacks to prove that uh, it, it was worth going over the traditional, more pen-centric build. Yeah, Sarpe got to have his work cut out for him. He'll be looking, I got to imagine, for Coast or Gunter in most of these fights, but he's trying to get through Shoxi, as you already covered, and how difficult that'll be. Meanwhile, Rapio often has a get-in free card with that ultimate, his ability to make it to Streak Up or Joshi, but those are some carries that aren't so bad at aren't so they don't kind of struggle with kind of peeling for each other or themselves back there maybe up against Tsukiyomi you don't love the odds but I think it's gonna be real interesting watching these junglers and who could have more impact in that back line and is Kha'Zix kind of gonna be there with Raphio I imagine Kana's gonna be there with Sarpe and that's gonna make life pretty miserable for this snake on his back line and kind of how they deal with that dive it could find ways to re-engage I've seen that be really critical in the SEC so far it's not even always that first team in but how your team sort of responds with that counter engage can you guys get your feet planted in the middle of that fight, find your target and keep your carries alive as Shoxi has clearly found his target. It's Kana over in solo and there's no chance of escape. Rapio cleans up for his third kill of the game. And this time, Coast is able to get that assist as well. So you're you're looking pretty good at least to get a little bit of gold onto him because as good as the right side of the map has done so far for Snake Hunters, this left side has struggled a two-level lead for Streak Up in this lane. I would have thought that Coast would have gotten some assists from that fight by blue earlier on but maybe uh maybe i was mistaken on the darkest of nights being impactful at all in that fight because he doesn't boast any assists so far besides that one right there you've got to maybe spend some more time on this left side of the map if ko starts to get pressured more but for the time being i mean if he's able to stay afloat not get killed if he has to give up a purple here and there that's fine because you're getting a lot of farm on the right Rapio is the target now as Pandemonium caught out the enemy jungler. Almost find a stun, but that's not enough to keep Rapio alive there. Are you surprised, though, that we haven't seen Streak Up try and get a bit more involved? We're still early on in this only 10 minutes and 30 seconds, but you often see this Apollo ultimate that's across the sky used to impact some of these battles, even when they're occurring across the map. And so far, Coast has kind of had a bit more of an impact with his ultimate than, than Streak Up has. Just a bit rare uh, when you win in these Apollo games for that to be the case. Yeah, I, I am a little bit surprised, but that early in the game, I mean, you think about the early blue buff invade, then yep. it, that's the three kills, and then only one kill on Kana, and he got surprised pretty effectively by a blink uppercut from Kumbakarna. You're not going to have time to get over there and help him anyways, and those early, those early rotations like that, I mean, if it's to mid, no big deal, but to get all the way over to solo lane is pretty heavy. Coast dropping the ultimate. Yes, Sarpe point blank, but Streak Up takes all the question marks out of that engagement. 
We said we wanted Street Cup to get a bit more involved with the ultimate. Maybe that's not quite the best example of it, but pretty much well used there close on that duo side. That's a much needed kill for Streak Up. Can really put Coast behind on a Hunter who's pretty known for being a bit slow in the early game anyway. He's going a real traditional build. Maybe some of that normal slowness from Shibalanke is not there, but I think Streak Up now in a great position, so we might see some more rotations from him as a level 13 force on this map as Pretz can't take any damage from Gunter. Early squishiness from this Kabrakan who falls down into the Ima monster, but does manage to survive. Very close. Don't don't mind that play at all, though, from Snake Hunters. I mean, you're basically just stat checking Pandemonium at that point. And right. I think that you're exactly right to say that they that Preds might have been caught off guard. I think it might have caught Snake Hunters off guard how much damage they were doing to him. And they go, yeah, why not? Let, let's go for it. Let's, <laughs> let's go for the double ultimate. They end up slightly short, but as long as they don't get punished for, for losing those ultimates and those being on cooldown for a little bit, I like the aggressiveness. I like the, the limit test in that moment. And now you know. Now you've got a better idea of where Preds is protections-wise and how much help you need in order to get him down. I think Kha'Zix also used his ultimate over near Solo. Didn't find much there. Wonder if that was a blink that got interrupted as this greater Scorpion goes down on left. This is a great conversation. You know, is the buff enhancement, is just getting the greater Scorpion on its own enough? Or do you think when you're taking that objective, you need to feel confident that your team's going to be there for, next ne for that next Gold Fury spawn? What's that calculus like on when you go for the Scorpion? It's a good question. I think that the main thing for me is that, yeah, the good, you know, the little bit of golden experience you get is certainly nice. The buff enhancement feels really good, and this is the exact time where it can feel really good, where both your, your duo side buffs are up, you do the scorpion first, then you grab both buffs, and, and you have a pretty decent power spike, specifically for your ADC. As upgraded red, not a massive deal, but upgraded purple is very, very strong because you get so much more attack speed. I do think it is important, though, that now you have priority on timer on that gold fury you've got to be the ones to be ready and teams might not be accustomed to that timer yet you know how long does it take for an objective to spot after that scorpion's been taken does everybody know that quite yet probably not so you've got to try and be there and maybe make a play looks like snake hunters are, are, are on top of it they get there on time but gold fury was up for a little bit i kind of wonder if pandemonium had done greater scorpion instantly reset and then set up around that gold would snake hunters have been ready i don't know i guess we'll never know yeah instead of like they were positioning really greedily maybe looking for for coast to step a bit out of line over there in duo once they finally reset from that it's snake hunters getting that oracle vision getting a little bit of control of that neutral area established first but this game's still very much anybody's game very very close in terms of golden experience there's some specific matchups where things don't look great it looks like Preds has kind of struggled to keep up in farm as has coast on that other side and it's Josh a good bit a good bit behind Gunter in that middle lane but it kind of all evens out across it. it's more on these direct matchups with our advantages but look at this this is my exact sort of curiosity with the timing on the scorpion because it's Snake Hunter's here first, though Streak Up has the ward. This is not happening without the knowledge of Pandemonium made their way in. In comes Preds to the back line. Grasp nice death landing as well, and Gunter low as is Coast Pandemonium. Get the Fury, and they win the fight on the backside. Rapio does get one in trade, but a two for one. Make it two for two as Rapio finds himself a double. And Kha'Zix has got nowhere to go. It's another kill for Joshi. Two, one, and two for the Persephone. I mean, it's two for three. Still in Pandemonium's favor. Might be two for four if Sarpe can be accurate enough. It's gonna be close. No, maybe not. I was gonna ask if right. Kumba had his passive up, and he does. So beads for Kumba passive. Both sides coming away probably feeling like they won that. But certainly Pandemonium is the team on top after that engagement. Still at the end of the day, it's a two for three if they get the Gold Fury. And I've got to give a ton of credit to the duo lane here. Preds and Streak Up just yep. have great ultimates in sync perfectly they lock in the back line and streak up is right there ready to go a little bit unfortunate i'd say for snake hunters that gunter isn't able to steal that away with the auto monster but good secure by pandemonium and understanding that look we could have lost that fight really that should have gone at least four kills for pandemonium i'm surprised that chocks got away at all in the first place that could have been a d side easily i i just like the way that pandemonium's attacking so far they haven't been dissuaded by that first fight going really poorly for them they're ready to get in there and be aggressive and i think we saw a little bit in that fight uh to kind of my point earlier about how important it is 
to have that counter initiation ready. And I think when you've got Apollo, yeah. that does make things a bit easier, right? To, to be able to land wherever you want with that ultimate. But in general, even though Snake Hunters were there first and had it started and seemed to be set up where they wanted, Preds and Streak Up just were monsters in that fight, man. Had the counter engage ready and really put Snake Hunters on their heels. Now we have our first real lead of this game. About 2,000 gold out in favor of the order side team. Feeling a little bit comfortable. Now the Greater Scorpion on right going down. I don't know if I feel quite that same tension with the with the Fire Giant Greater Scorpion. I think Gore wants to go with Forp and Gorp for those two. We'll see if yep. he establishes that later on. But you can kind of take down that Greater Scorpion on fire, I feel like, without worrying so much about setting it up for the other team as you would over on the Gold Fury side. Right. I mean, how many 17-minute Fire Giants do we see typically in a game this close? Not very many. It, it requires yep. more itemization, more levels to be able to get there and, and, and try and pull that Fire Giant down. So you're not at, at nearly as much of a risk of having that objective get burned without you there as you are with an early gold field. Uh, I do want to point out that even though Snake Hunters have really lost every engagement nearly since uh, <laughs> since that first one around blue, it's, it's not all bad because Rapio is boasting five of the six kills for their team, and he's near the highest level in the game. He's level 17. I think Streak Up just went over to 17 and when we're talking about level 20 upgrades and what gods like the these upgrades and all that kind of stuff Sukiyomi Bumba's hammer might be the <laughs> strongest combo in the entire game right now so if he's the one power spiking if he's the one farming really hard that's a good sign for the snake hunters Kana moves up for the zone. Pyromancer is the call for Pandemonium. But in comes Shoxy Foxy with the epic uppercut. Pyromancer reset and Gunter buries Kana easily. Snake Hunters grab the Pyromancer, but Preds has moved in. He sees an opportunity to control the fight. But great use from Kha'Zix on the ultimate. That resets. In comes Streak Up, dropping the Mez. But an excellent first ability there from Kha'Zix. Had a great fight so far, but does not deter Sarpei, who moves into the back line. Puts down Gunter. Now Rapio sandwiched. Yet again, Pandemonium found an excellent way to re-engage the Rapio does find one more kill to make it two for one. I think Rapio's out as well. Prez not going to be able to catch him. Shoxi not going to be quite as lucky, but a two for two with Snake Hunters getting the Pyromancer is a definitely a good response. I'm actually surprised that it didn't go even better for Snake Hunters. Yep. Kana just way too far forward. Very, very low in the magic defense department. I mean, that's what these soul laners are going, these, these hybrid items. They are super strong when ahead, but against something like a Scylla, an Ansile Shifter's Shield combo is not going to be enough to, to stop her from dealing significant damage to you. Now a Runic Shield in the equation, which I like overall for Kana up against what Snake Hunters have, but when you're sitting on, you know, Runic Shield 1 and then you get 2 tapped by a Scylla and you're thinking, is this Runic Shield really going to do enough in order to stop that? You know, I kind of wish I would have gone you know, Talisman of Energy or Genji's Guard or something a little bit more beefy with some more protection. Kana's got to try and respect that damage a little bit more because even with another magic defense item and runic shield, I think it's still pretty offensive focused. He's going to have to be careful. And I think that's a big uh, sort of calculus for all these soul laners nowadays is you kind of got to decide with that very first starter item if you want a little bit of extra sort of protections or if you want to be a bit more aggressive with it, like this bluestone start. And, and it makes them vulnerable to some early ganks, I think, and as we just saw, to just not so silly damage as Preds catches a little bit of that as well. Feeling a little bit stronger with that Thebes finish and some extra health from the Sovereignty, but still doesn't love getting hit by the Crush. We've got ourselves a Primal Fury dance now, as in come both teams. Looks like those Sarpe looking for a bit of a loop in the back of the fight. He'll reveal himself now, moving up on those minions. Maybe he doesn't actually go for the minions. He might have a complete loop around back here that Snake Hunters don't know about. No, I love the, the plant set up from Joshi. I think that's very smart, but I, I, I favor Snake Hunters in this fight because Bumba's Hammer is done for Rapio. First upgrade on the board. And like I said, I think this might be one of the best combos in the whole game. So Rapio needs to get in there and start poking a little bit because you just always have buttons up. Preds goes first, but he's a bit isolated in the back line. Good work from Kha'Zix. That will grab two. I'm a monster comes down. Doesn't deal a ton of damage. Rapio puts Preds down all the same. Sarpe is the next target for Kha'Zix. As Vaporous Coast gets Kana. Shriek up, makes his way into the back. And does find one kill, but not an excellent trade. As he goes down, it's a double for Coast. Four for one. And they want to make it a full-on deicide. It's Joshi getting hunted. But with that stun not landing, I think Joshi might be out. But is the rest of the team, Adro, just going to go for fire in this spot? Yep, who cares about a Primal Fury? Oh, Joshi fails the jump over Whoa. the wall, and Kha'Zix get a 
barrel stuff him with the paralyzing spit. That time, Pandemonium, so often in this game, I mean, you think about the earlier Gold Fury fight where they come in and Prez and Streak Up have great ultimates. That was a counter engage. That was really one of the first hard engages on Pandemonium side that they tried to get it started. And again, it ends up going pretty poorly. Think about the Pyromancer fight. Kata gets bursted, insta-killed, but it goes better for Pandemonium on the re-engage, not necessarily the initial engage. And that time, Pandemonium just get a little bit impatient. I think Fred's found yep. a, a suboptimal wall. He got Rapio, but Sarpe jumps in and instantly has to use the ultimate because he was just taking so much damage. That wall from Preds walling Sarpe off ended up being really detrimental to the Pandemonium. And yeah, I'm wondering if they thought they were going to get more, a bit more out of Sarpei's flank. He was sitting on the backside of Snake Hunters, basically, they that entire engage. And, and <laughs> as you're saying, they really didn't. And maybe that was a bit of where things didn't quite go the way for them that they wanted as well. But now they're in a tough spot. It's Fire Giant for Snake Hunters, and with three Tier 2 towers up and a Tier 1 on his last leg over there on the left. Plus, a Primal Fury going to Snake Hunters. This lead is about to balloon out of control. And things are already scary with some of these critical items getting finished. The Soul Reaver adding more percent pin there for Gunter. A Porish Coast has the Kin Size online coming in that last slot. They'll be able to get through not only the backliners, but these tanks a bit more easily now, too. And that's bad news for Pandemonium. And, and Rapio just had such a good fight last time around, too, because he was the one that they tried to engage upon, knowing that he doesn't wait, have a way out of that Kabrakan cage, but instantly used that piercing moonlight. Ended up not only hitting Preds, but also Sarpe after Sarpe had committed and you're able to, to dash around and get your damage off during that time, and it actually put Irapio in a really, really good spot away from the rest of Pandemonium, which forced Streak up in, and the, the dominoes continue to fall in Snake Hunter's favor. The problem now for Pandemonium is, okay, we've established that they're better on the counter engage than the, than the primary engage, but you're going to have to primary engage, well, maybe not. Yeah, Shoxy Foxy goes in first with the epic uppercut. Streak up uses both relics in response, but Fred's left on an island. He gets flattened by the Ana Monster coming out from Gunter. Mid tier two is down. And that ended up being more of a hard defense than sort of that soft one we sometimes see. Kana pays the price, he's low, and Fred's sent to the afterlife. Now it's mid Phoenix under threat, and Sarpe again looking for a flank, but there's just no window to make it work. An upgraded shell still not used from Foxy. I don't want any part of that if I'm Sarpe, and instead he makes the right decision, stays out. And that is just game blowed wide open for Snake Hunters. I mean, Coast and Gunter both still have their relics. So does Rapio. You're basically Scary. only missing Blink from Shoxy and Beach on top, they're tough. Yeah, Coast holds on to his beads, even with the engage there from Kana. But now it's time for the dunk from Streak Up. But Gunter manages to survive, moves into the back, but Sarpe gets Gunter anyway. But now they've lost Streak Up. Rapio moving into Joshua in the backside, but Aegis means there's not a ton of shots, but he doesn't need them all anyway. And they can't even get the execute coming through from Kana. It gets blocked. Coast gets the double kill. Joshi does manage to get one, but Sarpe falls as well. All kinds of action here on the left side, but I think that might be it for the Snake Hunter's push. They don't have enough members left alive on the back of this, but with a full deer side, and Rapio still alive, I suppose they can keep right on going. Yeah, they don't need a whole lot of members if they've got no one standing in their way. Snake Hunters get off to a good start. Pandemonium comes back. It looks like they're going to be able to make it work. But at the end of the day, man, Tsukiyomi, he was 5-1 when he got the Bumpus Hammer completed. Ends yeah. up 9-1. and one. I really feel like when Tsukiyomi's in the game right now, you're on a clock because he is just so hard to beat once he gets a hold of that Bumpus Hammer. No one beat him this time around. He was able to get to the late game. Yeah, and how important was this front line for them as well? I feel like Kha'Zix and Shoxy played well. Shoxy getting them in a consistent engage, and then Kha'Zix hitting those, those fadeaway stuns, always having good ultimates. And, of course, we can count on Gunter on Scylla to follow up if there's any amount of setup there. Great first game here for Snake Hunters. Kind of as you said, they've kind of won the outs on this one, the beginning and the late, kind of let Pandemonium get that mid, but that was not enough for them to get the win. We'll be back with the breakdown and game two, though, just after a very short break.
I would say there's an upset brewing, but it, it seems like anything can happen here in the EU SCC. So maybe standings-wise, there's a potential upset brewing here so far. Snake Hunters take game number one, and it is convincing, Mifflin. This is a 25-minute game that the Snake Hunters just kind of roll over. It looks like for a moment there, Pandemonium was going to win this game after that Gold Fury fight. They win a good skirmish. They got a couple thousand gold lead, and then it just slips away, and the Snake Hunters... Use that team comp and that team fight to get themselves the win. Yeah, that moment you're highlighting around the gold for you, for me, was really the only moment that I thought Pandemonium was had any real semblance of control over that match. But immediately they group up around that fire giant. Kana steps a little bit too far forward, eats an epic uppercut, groggy strike combo immediately into the I'm a monster. Lose out on his life, loses out on the pyromancer, fire giant, and then immediately after the game, snake hunters just look good here. Yeah, they look fantastic. I think Vaporish Coast, we, we had questions going into this game on the Jabalanke and how this pick would look. Obviously, he's a very good player, but he was just sitting in the back free casting, it felt like, effectively throughout the onset of, of the ending of that game. And you wonder then how much of that is the Jablanke, how much is that is the team comp built around him. What do you think of the X-Ball here in our first look in the SEC? Look, it's hard to say, right, when, how well X-Ball is doing. Sure, he played well. The death toll looked like it really did help him out with sustain and lane. But it's so hard to talk about anyone besides the guy you're seeing on the screen That's right true. now. Rapio was creating that space for the X-Ball to free cast. Rapio was killing everyone, dealing immense damage. He even decided to go towards a more tanky build towards the tail end of the match and really frontlined for his team as well. This guy was doing it all. Yeah, 13 KDA and 17,000 damage in a 25-minute game feels pretty good to me. There's been so much conversation around the Tsukiyomi here, Mifflin, it, throughout what we've seen so far in the SEC. Lots of players seeming to think that you've just got to take this pick away, and, and I think that this game is a great data point for why this pick is so strong. Obviously, Rapio very, very good on this pick, but when you get a player with this mechanical skill on a pick like this, the ability to skirmish and team fight and lock down and pour out the damage, you gotta wonder if it's just worth banning out next time. Yeah, uh, most teams have already uh, agreed that it is generally worth just banning out. Tsukiyomi has been a pretty consistent talk pick in the SCC, and I'm expecting the same from the SPL. Rapio shouldn't be allowed to play this god again. Uh, that's as, as far as you can go with it, as far as analysis goes. Uh, if Pandemonium can't pick it themselves in that first slot, I think it should be very easily banned out. Uh, three at four and seven, Gunter, sort of the least attractive KDA on the team, but I think more important are the damage numbers. I mean, 11,000, a little bit lower from maybe what you'd hope on the Scylla, but you were able to get that damage out nonetheless. Really, the, the, that's the biggest difference is... Look at Josh over there for Pandemonium, 22,000 damage Oof. on this Persephone, but there wasn't really much from anyone else on Pandemonium. Streak up only 6k damage, only five, four, 500 above Preds, what the Kabrakan was able to do. So it just seemed like, you know, Gunter was able to get off some of that burst damage in the late game, and then you left Rapio and, 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 uh, and Vaporish Coast in those fights to just sort of clean up. So now you do need to shift here if you're Pandemonium. I mean, you're 2-0, you're at the top of the SEC, you're playing with house money a little bit early on here, but when you got teams like Elysium and, and maybe even Snake Hunters and the other squads here, you need to try to build up as much of a cushion as you can because remember, the top two teams are the ones that move on to the playoff event. So if you're Pandemonium here, Mifflin, is, is check mark number one for picks and bans, just taking the Tsukiyomi away if you're not going to pick it yourselves. Yeah, if, if you're not taking it in the very first slot, I'm talking first pick overall, you got to ban it. There, there's no way you let that one through. Outside of that, potentially maybe you want to keep your eyes on the Scylla a little bit if you are Pandemonium. But interesting, interestingly enough, it is going to be Snake Hunters in that first pick slot. They're going to bring it to the Pandemonium here, force them into making a decision. Either you ban the Tsukiyomi or Snake Hunters are just going to take it again. Well, Guan Yu, 56% SCC ban, just Athena and Yamoja above that in the ban percentage. So that is somewhat interesting. We made a pretty big deal about how Guan Yu wasn't picked or, or banned at all there in game number one, but it's only about half the time, I suppose, that we've seen that. Feels like a lot more uh, we, we're, we're talking about the Guan Yu. So still let through in the first three bans here. Kepri is going to take a hit as well as the Nemesis, so still a bit of a jungle focus here from the Snake Hunters. And that's the right move. you got to take the Tsukiyomi away. 13 KDA, 16, 17,000 damage, whatever it was that Rapio was able to do. It's just not worth trying to, to roll the dice against here. As well as a Scylla ban. So Snake Hunters obviously off a, a decent Scylla game there from Gunter. 
realizing that that pick just kind of transcends any individual player, and if Scylla can get off the burst damage, then you don't want anyone playing it. Yeah, I like the bans all the way across the board. Snake Hunters kind of playing to their own role and get themselves an Athena, which was banned out in that first phase last time around. Now forced to be available because of the respect ban towards the Tsukiyomi. I like Pandemonium's bans as well, just because that's what ranked bans look like. You don't want to deal with the, the cream of the crop. Might as well get rid of Tiamat. Might as well get rid of that Tsukiyomi. So across the board so far, both teams doing a very good job. Apollo first up overall for Pandemonium. Going to bring you that global presence. At least try and match a little bit of what this Athena is able to do. And likely could go towards their mid laner in this slot as well. Instead, though, going to be the Sun Wukong locked in. Could go into the jungle. Could go into solo. Certainly a little bit of flex potential. I was wondering when we were going to see Sun Wukong picked up here in this matchup. Especially with, with the amount of talking we did about the solo laners. 78% win rate across like nine games. You know, that's not... We've seen Wukong a couple of times, and he's won a few of those games. We, we've now seen Sun Wukong in a good bit of the games here at the SEC, and he's won more than his fair share, 78%. Very strong pick there out of the solo lane. So now Kana is going to have a lot of weight on his shoulders, especially if you go into that Bluestone build. It's such a strong pick here in this current meta after the most recent update to the game as well. Cupid, we've seen a little bit of. It's another Kumba Karna pick up here for the Snake Hunters Myth one. What do you think? The, the Cupid Kumba duo lane. The Cupid Kumba duo lane's got some interesting mechanics, to say the least. You could heart bomb a minion and then use belly flop to send it at your opposition. Uh, probably not something we're going to get too much <laughs> of a look at, but certainly some potential there. I don't think it's really about the duo lane potential for this lane. Cupid's always going to have the 1v1 up against just about anyone besides on her, certainly up against Apollo, going to favor Cupid in that 1v1. But Kumba Karna, I think for the first five or six levels, is just going to be hanging out in lane farming up and then really biding his time to make the rotation over to mid where again you've got phenomenal combos you can pick up any mage and just follow up off an epic uppercut or if athena is going into solo or even jungle use defender of olympus on kumba karna he's going to make sure it hits every single time yeah kumba such an interesting i suppose versatile pick but it's been fun kind of watch i love the way he plays just hasn't had the overwhelming success here that a lot of the teams maybe would have hoped out of the kumba so another chance here going into the Snake Hunter's composition. Kha'Zix eats a ban. It's the Cerberus taken away as well as the Hunbats. So the, the, the playmaking setup type picks may be Pandemonium realizing a little bit more of that and Snake Hunter suddenly have a very scary draft here. They're going to take away two of the best gods at doing that, providing setup and opening up here uh, for some team fights. Aphrodite and Agni taken away as well now by the Snake Hunters. So interesting priority there, Mifflin. A couple of the mid lanes getting taken away at the end of the Snake Hunter's ban phase. Yeah, I like those bands in general. Aphrodite in particular would have meshed really well with this Pandemonium draft. Have Sun Wukong or Kamazots initiate your fights and then back off from a range as well as just pocket healing to make sure they can stay inside of those fights. Would have just worked out. But if you want to take a closer look at Pandemonium's bands, one towards the soul laner, one towards the jungle, we know for a fact Kuma Karna likely going into that support role means that Pandemonium don't really know where this Athena is going to land. And I think they're going to try and keep them guessing for as long as possible. This last pick should really tell us where Snake Hunters are deciding to put this Athena, whether it be in solo or yeah, right. inside the jungle. Yeah, great point there. And, and you know... I look here, and it looks like Jungle Athena is what we'll get here for Snake Hunters in game number two with the Kukulun locked in. Kukulun Wukong, that's going to be a fun lane to watch throughout the game. Look at this raw pick, though. Something we saw through and through many, many times there in Season 7. If you can't get the Scylla to follow up on this setup that the Athena, maybe even the Cupid, the Kumba Karna, and the Kukulun are all going to be providing, get someone who can really follow up. If the Scylla is going to get taken away, maybe Ra is the next best to follow up on some of that setup. Yeah, and that setup is almost guaranteed when you've got such a good beads burning composition. Confound from Athena up every 12 seconds or so with some CDR means that every 12 seconds or so inside a late game team fight, you're forced to use your beads. You have to be ready for it. And then after that, Kumakarna can set up for this raw, the searing pain from a distance so easily. It's such a good frontline composition that the Snake Hunters have, whereas Pandemonium are bringing a little bit more uh, of the same frontline capacity, some setup from a range. Sobek likely going to be initiating the majority of these fights with Sun Wukong and Kamazot just kind of running amok in the back line. It's going to be really up to Apollo and Persephone from Pandemonium to keep each other alive. It was a 22,000 damage Persephone game in game number one for Joshi. Can he do it again in game two, this time with a win? Let's jump in and find out. That's a great point there, Dave. Uh, you got to ban Agni, not Persephone, despite the 22,000 damage. That was the worry. 
coming into this one on the other side there for Snake Hunters. We'll see if they proved correct and they can let Joshi play such a strong mid lane mage twice in a row and still come away with some wins. It is still Finch and Aggro here as we have moved into game number two. It's this Tainted Steel start again for Snake Hunters over there in the solo lane. Meanwhile, Pandemonium go with this Blue Stone on Wukong. You want to talk to you a bit about this Tainted Steel start? It feels like it's just almost always a great option over there in solo. Final Cave was even trying it in mid a couple days ago on his stream. Uh, when did you pick this one up, and, and how much do you like it? Well, normally you want it up against some sustain, and we saw last game that Kha'Zix picked it up on the Cerberus up against Achilles, and that makes a lot of sense. I mean, Achilles 2 ends up being more sustained than I think a lot of players give it credit for in the lane, and th that upgrade on Cerberus feels so good. On Kakale and up against Wukong, I'm a little bit more skeptical. I mean, it does. You do have sustain as Wukong through the ultimate. Kakale already has some anti-heal. The human formed one, that barbed spear, will end up anti-healing the Wukong. So it could actually be pretty potent anti-heal up against Somersault Cloud if you can apply the Tainted Steel and that barbed spear at the same time. But... I've got to think that Kha'Zix is buying it more here for the its stats, just just as a stat stick. I'm not completely sold on that quite yet. I think Bluestone is still the route that I would go. I think that Warriors is still a little bit underrated over there. I think that yep. those are options that I like a little bit more than just Tainted as a stat stick option. But it it doesn't look bad to upgrade it up against a uh, up against a Kamazot's late game. You're going to get some pretty decent anti-healing on him. You're going to get some good anti-healing up against the Hunter as you're trying to dive him later on. I don't know. I, I haven't tested it a whole lot. Uh, it just is it without needing the passive. I've loved it in those opportunities where I think the passive can be good. Wait a minute. Big taunt from Rapio on the Athena jungle, and Sarpe will fall for first blood. You saw this Athena pick kind of had Pandemonium guessing. In their last ban rounds, they banned a jungler and a solo laner, still a bit unclear on just what they meant to do with this Athena pick. But it's meant to go in the jungle and already looking great for Snake Hunter here to start the game off. And man, Athena, it's hard to say she's getting undervalued nowadays because she's so yeah. often picked, but letting her through is so difficult to deal with. This taunt so strong, you can play her jungle support or solo. Just, just such a great pick overall right now to, to slide into your draft. Agreed. I mean, she she is a premier god in, in Smite right now. Maybe yep. the premier god in Smite right now. Just she, she forces you to play. Your engage is so differently. She forces you to, to build differently. I mean, I, I'm a little surprised to not see beats right away for Sarpe because I think that yep. her threat is so great. She clears really well. She skirmishes well. Oh, by the way, if it's not Tsukiyomi with Bumba's Hammer, that's the best Bumba's, uh, best combination in the game. It's probably Athena with Bumba's Hammer. Like, those are the two <laughs> that really feel like they're super strong right now. So... I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm a little surprised to see Snake Hunters get this pick as well. I think that she is strong enough that you're going to have to show me a lot of stuff looks unbeatable before I'm willing to give you an, a shot to, to play a theater. It's also kind of start, starting to sound like Bumba's Hammer is just good, by the way, on, on most people yeah. that you can pick it up on. So that, that's the camp that I'm in right now. That is about as good of an upgrade as you can get on just about any starter out there. And, and you bring up a good point. Sir Pan has this blink in the jungle. I don't know if my man is trusting his ability to ult on on reaction to Rapio coming in, maybe with a dash, something like that. But he's going to need to use it preemptively. Not a whole lot of help once you're in the taunt with that ultimate. So he's going right. to be really, really careful that he's just not getting searing pained on cooldown because Confound will be there, and Rapio is going to look for him as the target. Put pressure on Joshi too. Get those speeds on cooldown. Maybe force his ultimate to be used as a way to get him out of there with that CC immunity. But I think Rapio has a real chance. But it puts a major pressure on Pandemonium, especially in this early game. And we know we'll be able to do it late, where maybe they can punish him a little bit more when that CC immunity is not there. Definitely. I, I just love this draft from Snake Hunters. I mean, you keep Gunter, the Silla gets banned, so we just put him on the exact same style of pick with the exact same style of composition and just let him go to work. I, I think it makes a lot of sense. Plenty of setup for this raw in this game. Kano, it's a long time to use that ultimate over there in that solar lane. In a world where he ends up using it no matter what, maybe he's a bit sooner to avoid the damage, but he thought he had a chance to get out of there. Did not quite materialize, and causing Rapio put some good pressure on solar over there on that right side of this map. 
talked a little bit about how you know some of that follow-up might have been missing from Gunter with the Scylla removed for him. And you're right that Raw is a great selection. If you just want to be able to use a, an ability that's up a lot, uh, that's guaranteed to hit with some CC, that one's going to be there. Provides them some good sustain paired with those hearts that can't be overlooked. And can this be another early bloop up invade fight on the right side? Kana is already in trouble. His ultimate was forced out early on, but makes it out of there with that ox form. But in comes Gunter and Shoxy Foxy onto the blue buff. Epic uppercut used already. Blue secured. Looks like Searing Pain a bit off time to Sarpe able to leap out of there. Yeah, it's not a it's not an easy task to be able to hit a, a Kamazot as he's coming down, but either way it doesn't really matter. Not gonna not gonna roast Gunter too hard for that one, but yep. obviously that that connection has got to find a home come team fight time because that didn't that one didn't matter too much. Those can win you a game or ultimately lose you a game if those aren't ta on time later. So it's something to keep an eye on for sure. But so far, so good for the Snake Hunters. Really should have been a kill on the Kana there. Just a little bit off the mark from Kha'Zix on the, on the shoulder push. Think that that damage plus CC likely would have taken down the Wukong. But at the end of the day, they still get his blue buff. They still force him back and still create a lead for this Kikulin. Keep some pressure on him over there. See if Kha'Zix can and maybe get the whole team to rotate over there and find a little bit more of that blue buff invade on that right-hand side. That's been a go-to strategy here in this set so far. He's early pressure on the blue buff. See what you can find and do on the back side. As Coast drops the ultimate, but Strick up just kind of walks on out of it. Still has those beads available. Shoxy can't lock him down either. And that's such a big part of the matchup into Cupid is how you can deal with that feels of love if you have the CC immunity. But just getting to kind of walk out of it, that shouldn't happen very often. No, I, I like the idea from Coast. Shox is on the way. We should be able to force his relics here at the very least. Not getting even a relic for that ultimate certainly feels bad, but that's what makes Cupid so strong is that you can kind of just wait until it's up and do it again because I'm yep. sure that's what he's going to do. I think Cupid being so strong last year was one of the things keeping Apollo really out of the duo lane meta. Time now that Cupid sees some nerfs, everything. Apollo's, you know, everyone's realized how good this pick can be. I I'm not surprised to see Apollo be that, that premier hunter over there in the duo lane, but I like Coast going back to this pick. I do think it's a positive matchup. Move up stripped away again by Snake Hunters. Can't quite get that taunt on Kana, who made his way out. I really thought that Joshi was going to rotate into this blue buff for the defense, but he, he went right back to mid. Some pressure from Gunter kind of forced that wave up, and Joshi kind of had to come over to defend. So that blue buff was just open for the taking there from Snake Hunters, and I like their continued pressure on this right side of the map, kind of forcing some rotations over to Pandemonium and making them deal with it, because Snake Hunters are not going away, and with these taunts, with this Athena in these fights, they're pretty heavily favored if Pandemonium don't have the right numbers there to, to try and help deal with it. And when you have a Ra that can push so well, it lets him rotate very easily and use the movement speed from his passive to, to get to those types of fights. I mean, good engage here by Pred, the better beads. Should still be a win for Preds, I think, getting those beads down, but my man could have pretty easily been pulled off a great engagement like that, so good work by Gunter to avoid it, as he's now a lot more vulnerable here in that mid. Searing Pain can be a good response to, to CC that you really can see coming. You can just use that Searing Pain to avoid it, but Something like that happens again, a real quick blink pluck or, or anything of the sort could certainly have my man in some trouble. Certainly Grasp of Death could, could, could fit that bill and cause some problems here for Gunter in that middle lane. So Snake Hunters only have the one kill, but this repeated blue buff pressure aggro has really put him behind. Has it's about 1,500 gold, a little more than that, in favor of Snake Hunters. That's not something to kind of disregard this early on in the game. If they want to continue looking for that pressure, Pandemonium are fighting a bit of an uphill battle. Definitely, and I think that the Snake Hunters are in a position in this game more so than last game to be more flexible with their pressure. Last game, Streak Up was huge on the duo side of the map, and Coast was really behind. In this game, Coast is in a very comfortable position. We, he's in a positive matchup. He's got options. Coast dropping down the Fields of Love. That causes a problem for Preds, who's forced to go into the ultimate. Gunter gets involved, but remember, he does not have his beads. Got to be safe as Coast and Preds both go down. ADC for support. Going to favor Pandemonium, especially when a double comes out from Sarpe. Finds Gunter in the back. It looks like Snake Hunter's finally getting slowed down as Pandemonium keep up the aggression, but a two-man taunt. Not going to be enough to keep Shoxy Foxy alive, but it sure was close as Rapio did all he could. 
really, really great fight from Pandemonium. Three for zero, put themselves right back in position. And this is where that Scorpion timing can really come back to bite you because Pandemonium get to three for zero you and then go, oh, Gold Fury, thank you. Uh, yep. You shouldn't have. We didn't, uh, we didn't even need it. <laughs> really, really good position for them to be in. And I've got to give credit, even though he doesn't get any of the kills, but I think credit deserves to go to Preds for how well that fight went because not only did he get the beads from Gunter in mid, before that engagement, but he starts off that engagement by getting coast speeds, and that yep. means that Joshi's ultimate is going to get a ton of value, and that it did exactly that. A perfect ultimate from Joshi. He's able to jump in, get his damage off. I mean, Sarpe is completely unchecked in that fight. These these hectic jungle fights where things are kind of all over the place just aren't conducive to Snake Hunter's composition. They want to play fights front to back, which means that you want to walk up, taunt the tank kill the tank, chase down the back line. That's what they want to do with this type of composition. In those all over the place fights where the jungler is behind us, but the tank's in front of us, and who knows what's going on. You know, the Persephone just dashed in. Like, th those sorts of fights are very difficult to play in that methodical kill this guy, then kill this guy, then kill this guy sort of strategy. Cupid's more conducive to that. You know, he, he does the the heart bomb, which is gonna kill that one dude. Raw abilities are technically AOE, but a lot of times they're they're trying to kill one dude. And when Pandemonium can up the tempo of the fights like they did right there, it makes it a lot harder for Snake Hunter's composition to be effective. It does, right? His coast now a bit stuck near the top side. Drops the fields of love. But Preds has that lurking in the waters used to reposition. But Rafio is now here. Taunt connects, epic uppercut there as well. But Pred still has not been cleared out from this fight. So Strikeup dashes in and Pooch puts Coast down quite easily with that so beautiful. Another one of these fights where Snake Hunters seem a little bit out of sorts. Grasp of Death connects, Foxy Foxy is done. And Rafio even gets chained up to it a bit, but should be able to get on out of there as he gets back towards the tower. And I think he kind of described it. Snake Hunters really want to Voltron together and make a really difficult team fight to deal with. But Pandemonium want to bust that up. They want to get their picks of their own and kind of spread these fights out a bit. And that's what they've been doing a really good job of in response. Looks like Snake Hunters are only really good at the very beginning of the game and kind of towards the late. So we've seen in both cases that kind of in the middle, things don't go Snake Hunters way. No, they haven't so far through game one or two. I mean, th that fight just seemed like very different mentalities for Snake Hunters. I mean, Coast is in a bad spot. Rapio's a, a little bit late on the ultimate, but maybe it had just come off cooldown. I, I assume it was up, but maybe we'll give him the benefit of the doubt. I think he's got to be there a little bit earlier if he can be. And then if Shoxi uses his epic uppercut to disengage Streak Up instead of trying to get the kill, onto Preds, that fight likely goes a lot better for Snake Hunters because Coast can then reposition. I mean, Streak Up didn't get nearly enough damage off that ultimate. I thought that that was going to kill Coast outright, but then he lands and you're, I'm thinking, oh, okay, this could go pretty well for Snake Hunters. Just, just use this opportunity to disengage. They should know that they don't have rotation priority coming out of mid and that Sarpe and is certainly going to be on the way, if not Sarpe and Joshi. That you got to have that, that timer in the back of your head that, all right, we've been here too long. We don't have good enough vision. We've got to get out. Instead of playing to get out, they play for kills and, and end up coming back to fight. Right back in this one as Kana gets the ultimate force out over in solo. Things have slowed down a bit. Fury not up just yet. Probably going to be about another minute or so before that one's back up. But Pandemonium still get grouping up on this left side of the map. Anyway, in particular, Sarpe and Preds get aggressive. Shoxy Foxy is plucked back in, nice but Searing Pain connects off a two-man mez. That puts Joshi low and might reset the calculus for Pandemonium on trying to force a fight on this left side of the map. That is some of what this team can do. Any amount of CC should set up for Gunter to find the damage as Pluck misses again. Shoxy Fox is getting right in the thick of things, but for not much reason, walking in all alone and never really makes his way out of there. He's had to be a bit more careful, man. They're, they're very clearly yeah. willing to just drop him at the drop of a hat. So he's got to make sure his positioning is, is really on point. And they will, too, because that Kumba is not particularly tanky at this point in the game. Just love this positioning from Pandemonium and, and the way that they're keeping the, the pace of this game high because you want you don't really want to let Double Guardian compositions get to the late game. They become really, really tanky. They end up still dealing good damage, especially Athena once she has that Bumba's Hammer. She's going to deal really competitive damage with just about anybody. 
and it becomes a lot easier to set the terms of the engagement and go in at accordingly with your Guardians. This sort of frantic pace is much better for a team composition like Pandemonium's, but Snake Hunter sensing the same thing decide they're going to send Kha'Zix over here to try and stop the bleeding. He is certainly stronger than Kana right now based on builds. Three items completed for Kha'Zix, only two and a half for Kana. And look at this aggressive wording from Pandemonium. They know what is going on on the order side of this duo side jungle. If anyone's moving up from Snake Hunter's Pandemonium, we'll see it. But all of Snake Hunters are here and present. And that deep wording maybe not going to be so critical here as this fight happens directly on the Oni Fury this time around. So Pay again, looking for some loop arounds, but Kha'Zix shows up. As you said, they're going to need his impact here with this Void Shield Mystical Mail done. It's going to be hard to deal with him once he starts that dive and, and sticks on someone in the back line. Very, very difficult. You've got a, an Athena ultimate coming on top of him as well, but Kana in trouble right away. Just one taunt, straight into a Somersault Cloud. And that's how easy it is. Raphael didn't even use the upgraded Sunder that he had. Kana! Dog, you don't have to land there. <laughs> you can land away from the team. What was that? Yeah, certainly curious, right? Whatever it was, it clearly wasn't on the same page as the team who did not want to engage whatsoever. And Kana certainly did. So it's the only Fury started up. Pandemonium looking for a way to re-engage back into the battle. And Coast is not at full HP in the back as Preds looks for the pluck. That means the, the beads are down for Coast earlier, but Kha'Zix does get Joshi, who's going to keep fighting posthumously using that passive of the Persephone, but in the back line on the streak up is the target. Shotzi, Foxy, and Rapio both land there. Not much streak up can do all on his own. Meanwhile, Sarpe using the ultimate more defensively than anything cannot confirm these kills. And now a chance for the re engage. No way for Sarpe to get out and Snake Hunters find a 4 for 0 on the back of a questionable play from Kana. Yeah, a questionable play from Kana puts them in a, in a horrible spot to begin with. And look at all these low health bars. You'd think that a Wukong would probably be able to do a little bit in order to take those num members down. But honestly, I think that Pandemonium likely still lose that type of engagement because Snake Hunters get to play it front to back. It's, hey, I'm going to taunt this guy, and then we're going to kill him. And then we'll see what happens from there. You know, it's it, you just kind of you just freelance it from there. A little bit of poetry in motion. Let, let, what, let the game come to you because you're starting off 5v4, in this case 5v3, because Kana already made your job a lot easier for you. And then, taught onto Joshi, he beads and started channeling that ultimate right away, or maybe it was ultimate first. It didn't matter. He gets sniped by Gunter. I thought Gunter might have been going for Gold Fury, and I was like, wow, that is way too early just to try and secure this gold. But he had his eyes on the prize, which was the mid laner on the other side. Well, well executed by Snake Hunters. Pandemonium, they need Sarpe and Kana to work in tandem with these blinks in order yes. to try and disrupt this. That's the only way that you're going to make this work. When team compositions like Snake Hunters are put together, it feels really oppressive, but you've got to find a way to get on top of Gunter and make sure that he is not able to follow up on these uh, on these engagements. you got to get on top of Coast and make sure that he's not able to step up and use that Fields of Love. You, you know, Athena's going to deal good damage, but with good enough Relic usage, the carries aren't going to get soloed by her. You've got to stop the follow up. Preds has the Purification Beach in response to all that CC you just covered. That's forced out, though, by Rapio before any real engagement starts. So just one more area where not only do they not have the extra defensiveness of a Relic, like maybe a Shell in that spot, but the beads he does have are already on cooldown. Pandemonium really need for that kind of initial part of the fight to go well. When Sarpe's left trying to clean up from from above half on those targets, he just doesn't have the damage to do it. He's gonna need a little bit more breaking room in Orange. just said to go in with Kana, who was a non-factor in that one, huh? Just, just died way too soon. I mean, way too much for free in the beginning of that fight. But Snake Hunters are not so much in control that Pandemonium cannot bounce back as Kana. He's once again the early target. He's rooted underneath this tier one on his own side of the map, but the follow-up is not there. Pandemonium are not that far behind, only about 1,500 gold or so to this last fight, so as long as they can adjust the way that they're engaging these fights, no reason why they can't win them. But the back line's all alone over to the left side. Joshi and Preds are there, at least forcing out the relics from Gunter. And getting the beads from Gunter is huge, because now that, that blink engagement and disruption is much more likely to be effective at w with, when he doesn't have the purification beads. I mean, the blink was used from Preds, but... 
you can weasel your way in there as Sobek fairly easily. You've got Kanas who still has Blink, Sarpe who still has Blink, though beads don't help you much against the Kalazots either way. And that's why I like the build that Gunter's gone for. He's gone for the Lotus Crown early on here, yep. and, and it's just the, I know that they're going to try and get on top of me. I'm going to put my heel down. I'm going to plant my feet, and I'm going to hope that all the props in the Solar Blessing are going to be enough. Uh, Rapio just looking for taunts anywhere he can get him. Pred engages on the backside of that taunt, and Foxy lands that ultimate on streak up way on the left side of the fight. So no hard engage still. It feels like Snake Hunters are just willing to step in and see what they can get, right? See what the response yeah. is from Pandemonium, and then hard commit afterwards as Kana gets caught on the right side. No ultimate. Still has beads though, but does not use them. Pyromancer back in the sights Ooh. of Snake Hunters again. Down below half, Joshi the only one nearby, but Snake Hunters confirm that medium side objective. But now for the engage, Foxy's gotten beyond the grasp of death and has the Defender of Olympus landing on top of it. Joshi didn't have a hope of getting out of there. Just a bad decision by Joshi. He, he was a solo agent getting in there, try and steal it away with that bone rush, but just way too hopeful that he would end up getting away from a Kuma Karna with Blink, a Kakon with Blink, and Athena. That's just not happening. Kana moves in to disrupt Snake Hunters on the Fire Giant. That will cost him his ultimate for the chance that little bit of disruption. Lands right in the middle of the squad again, but does still have the Purification Beads, but gets Heart Bomb stunned right on the tail end, and Kana is pushing up daisies. The next target gonna be Fred. Fields of Love dropped on top of him, and Ghost gives himself a double. These disjointed engagements with Pandemonium are not gonna be the answer here. No, it, uh, yeah, th it's the two things that are really bad. Uh, uh, like, going in, one by one is really bad against two particular types of compositions. Heavy CC compositions, because their buttons are going to be back up and we can just CC one guy, kill him, CC one guy, kill him. And they're really bad against healing compositions, because the, you go in, deal some damage, die, they heal up the damage you just did, and then your teammate goes in and the cycle repeats itself. Here's the deal, uh, Snake Hunters are a CC heavy hey, healing composition. So going in <laughs> one by one, is the easiest way to lose. I mean, it, it, it yep. just couldn't, it, it, it just makes it look really easy for the Snake Hunters. You said it perfectly. They're going in one by one, disjointed, not on the same page. And Snake Hunters' composition is designed to eat that type of play for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And that's what Snake Hunters have done so far. Fire Giant now on all five members and plenty of towers to collect to extend this gold lead out even further. And how dominant has Athena seen here in this one? Pairing that with another CC heavy guardian in Shoxy Foxy on the Kumba has made life really miserable on Pandemonium. They've had to get so many beats, which I, I assume they normally would not get. So our pay forced to get them, Preds and Kana all forced to pick them up. And still, just seems like they're not able to get the maximum value out of even that. That ability to sort of evade that CC has not been there for them. So now the map going to be spread out a bit. Rafio takes care of the mid tier one. They send the rest of the squad for the most part over to deal with this left side tower. And if I'm Pandemonium, I'm doing exactly what they're doing, kind of grouping up and hanging back. I don't know how much of this smoke I want right now. Zero, because you've got some <laughs> at least one upgrade on the side of Snake Hunters right now in the starter writing department. Coast has upgraded that death toll. You've got no level 20 members on the other side, and nearly everybody for Snake Hunters is going to have their starter upgraded sooner rather than later. If I'm Snake Hunters, I don't even know if I'm pushing for Phoenixes at this point. I think I'm just trying to get everybody level 20 backed and then set up. And ready to go. The work from Preds gets the beads out from Coast, who drops the ultimate point blank onto Sarpe. Diving to the back line is Shriek up, but the taunt is there, and Preds doesn't get to survive. Kha'Zix makes his way to the back line, looking for Joshi as the epic uppercut lands. But these are two kills now for Pandemonium, but it's Rafio's turn to re-engage. Sarpe gets dunked. Next up will be Shriek up. And Kana, the only member who managed to get a back off, will be leaving as the rest of Snake Hunters push down left. I mean, it was a good good idea there from Pandemonium. That time they all in commit, and it goes a lot better, but you're just far enough behind at this point that the damage takes too long to go off. The Guardians do a lot of damage now at this point. They've gotten pretty deep in their build, Frontliners at the very least, because Kha'Zix is doing a lot of it. It's not a Guardian, but a Warrior there on that Kukulun. He, he's going to be tough to stop. 
Looks like eventually they give up on this triple tank Phoenix Siege. Despite having damage from Rapio and Kha'Zix, that's not, you know, not too bad on that structure. Losing the back line entirely really slows them down on this push. So good work by Pandemonium, I think, just to get to Gunter and Coast. They paid a heavy price. I don't think four lives is what they're going to happily trade for every time, but it worked for them there as it is. This Pendulum of Ages picked up here for Gunter, as you said, gonna add a ton of damage really throughout his cycling through these abilities, not just on that front load, because the ability to keep that mana pool up. Scary for Pandemonium to try and deal with some of these upgraded starters. I mean, look at, he, he uses all three abilities, it takes a chunk of his mana, and then it regens really quickly, because he's got a ton of MP5 between the Pendulum of Ages, the Rod of Tahuti, and Lotus Crown, boasts really good MP5 as well, so you're chilling in that department if you're Gunter. But, I mean, you look at not just that upgrade, but the, the Sentinel's embrace now for Shoxi, the Bumba's hammer yeah. done for Rapio. You've got one upgrade on the other side I'm seeing so far. It looks like Sarpe has picked up that protector of the jungle, which is a key upgrade for sure. It's gonna make these fire giant fights a lot better if Pandemonium get to a fire giant fight because with Snake Hunters as strong as they are right now, they might be able to just walk in and start pushing Phoenix and not worry about that, that upgrade at all. Look at this engage though. Pledge drops the beads to deal with that taunt. In comes Grasp of Death, and they get the dunk in from Streak Up as well. But it's one for one Preds for Gunter early on. And again, the backline are the targets for Pandemonium. Kana makes it up to the air. Sarpei hit by the Epic Uppercut recently lands as well. But Coast still standing and healthy. They put down three, and Sarpei will be the next member sent to the afterlife. I think this game is done. They still have Coast. And they can push right on through. Unless Sarpei can find a kill, he can't. It's a triple kill for the Penta Kid, and that is it. Snake Hunters find themselves a nice little 2-0. Well played by the Snake Hunters, and like I said coming into this set, this one's going to be fun to see who comes out on top, because Pandemonium coming in with all this momentum after beating Elysium, now Snake Hunters have thrown their hat in that ring as being competitive on that same level. I think that they just came in with, with really, really solid compositions, a very solid game plan for how they wanted to come out and attack this Pandemonium squad, and they executed it to near perfection. Got to work on that mid-game. Like you said, they, they're, they're good early, and then they end up winning late, but the mid-game, they seem to struggle a little bit. If Snake Hunters can get that worked out, they might be sitting on top of the EU SEC not too long from now. Yeah, this is a scary team to deal with. The EU SEC is very much a competitive region here at this point. I think the same for the NA SCC, man. You really never know who's going to win a game about as competitive as you've ever seen it down here. Basically what I'm saying is you don't want to miss a minute of it. We're going to be right back after a short break to break that one down.
It was officially standings upset complete now. The Snake Hunters in two games take down Pandemonium and causes a little bit of chaos towards the top of the standings here in the EU SEC. We'll get there in just a minute. Mifflin, what do we see here in game number two? I mean, it was a great draft for, uh, around a big team fight. We figured the Raw would have plenty of setup there, and Snake Hunters made good on a lot of the, the utility and the team fight that they brought themselves in the draft. It just felt like Snake Hunters had a better grasp on what they were looking to do inside of these team fights. How many times did a fight start off with Rapio dashing forward, finding a couple beads, and then immediately falling back and setting it up again? How many team fights started off with maybe the Sobek on the enemy side going in with a pluck, getting it beezed out, and immediately losing his life? It just felt like, in general, that Snake Hunters had a better identity, a better concept of what they were looking to do, and also their engage was a lot cleaner. Yeah, Kha'Zix looked great on this Kul'Kullen as well. We figured one of the two between the Sun Wukong or the Kul'Kullen would, would start to take some of these team fights over, and it ended up being Kha'Zix down the stretch. 18,000 damage in a 26 or so minute game, 9 KDA. Serious numbers coming out of your warrior there. And if you're a fan of the Snake Hunters, you're a fan of Vaporish Coast, you're loving the way that this guy played here today. Great game there in game number one. Fantastic look here, I think, Mifflin on the Cupid here in game number two. And that's with a ton of focus being put on a Vaporish Coast inside Look of these at this. fights. <laughs> yeah, even in this last clip, I mean, four people took turns trying to dive this man, and they just couldn't finish it off, due in large part, again, to that front line that the Snake, snake Hunters have. Kha'Zix, Rapio, and Shoxy Foxy doing a phenomenal job just peeling the entire game, but you gotta have someone pretty nuts behind the wheel if you're gonna have Vaporish Coast looking like that. Yeah, 7, 3, and 8 for the Cupid. 5, 0, 8. For, uh, for Kha'Zix there. Rapio as well on this jungle Athena. Interesting build path there, Mifflin. A little bit more bruisery. We were talking about how sometimes the, the jungle Athenas will, will go just full on damage, but it seemed to work for Rapio here, and there was plenty of damage to boot. 21,000 for sh or, uh, That's damage taken, excuse me. Good lord. I was like, <laughs> the wrong column. 21,000 <laughs> damage for the Kumbakarna. Yeah, right. 23,000 for Vaporish Coast. Uh, 15,000 and 18,000 for Kha'Zix and, and Rapio respectively though, so that bruisery Athena build still was able to put out some damage numbers. And was able to stick it around in those team fights forever. I mean, Bumba's hammer is so good on Athena right now, just that healing coming yep. through. After every single ability also applies on Reach as well. Surprised that we didn't get to see the Athena go towards that Polynomicon that's almost a staple in Athena jungle right. builds, all the way back since 2012 as well, but Rapio. Certainly innovating a little bit with this more bruiser-centric build, likely just going for that because he knows that Kha'Zix is going to be able to make up for that lack of damage on this Kakalin. Yeah, it was a great look for, uh, for Rapio there and a great look for Snake Hunters here today. Let's take a look at your updated standings. Snake Hunters up top now, 2-1. They own that tiebreaker over Pandemonium. Pandemonium still tied, supposedly, or technically rather, for first place outside of that tiebreaker, the head-to-head -head matchup. Elysium, what a weird world we live in where Elysium is in third place with the name recognition they have. They'll have a chance to bump up and tie for first as well in our next matchup of the day, Elysium versus the Accounting Department. And if it, it's a far cry from the SCC of last year where it felt like Belt Slap was just running through everyone. Belt Slap, hell, I don't even know if they dropped a game, much less dropping a set throughout the entire year. Now every single team three weeks in, three weeks in, or two weeks in one game in, have all at least dropped a game. The SCC in, in EU looks very competitive. Yeah, I'm going to make some enemies here, but I think even if we had the, the old Belt Slap roster in its entirety in this version of the European SEC, well, they wouldn't look nearly as dominant. I mean, the European SEC and the SEC in general over in North America as well is so stacked this year. Even in this next upcoming match, Elysium up against Accounting Department, you got guys like uh, Deathwalker, Wolfie, Kalas, you know, stop me if you've heard any of these names before, uh, up against guys like Trickstank and Spudio. Yeah, I'll stop you right there, Miff, when so, I've heard yeah, all the... Good. I've heard all good. the... <laughs> I've heard all those names already. Look, that's going to be a fantastic match of both of those teams trying to make their way up to that two and one spot up there uh, tied for first place here in the Stangs. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, Elysium versus Accounting Department.